<laughs> Another thing, <laughs> you know, sometimes when Farrakhan get moved by the spirit, um, or, or just get moved by the energy of the people and the truth as he sees it, I mean, he says a lot of things. And I don't know how many of us that talk a lot have not stuck our foot in our mouths <laughs> at some point or another. Okay, we might have meant that in a certain way, but maybe we could have. It could have came out a little different, especially those of us who talk for a living or talk a lot, or are content creators, or you know, if you talk a lot, you bound to say something that's a little bit um, inaccurate. It doesn't mean your whole existence is a damn fraud. Now, for instance, I believe I was at Mount Marion. Matter of fact, I'm pretty sure I was, because uh, most of y'all know I'm in Milwaukee. So Farcon is Chicago is about what an hour and ten minutes away from where I'm at right now. Okay. Um <laughs> what Farcon did, there was a lot of stuff going on by the nation of Islam. I remember the climate and the time very well. All that stuff was going on with Khalid Muhammad and uh Khalid wanting to continue to see what happens is it becomes what is the goal. Okay. So what happened was at this time the nation was just being ris uh, um, how you say it? resurrected, and there was this, all this stuff, this 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 campaign to say Farrakhan was responsible for the murder of Malcolm X, and it just kept going on and on. And most of it by the white press. It wasn't even by the black press. It's the white press, like it always is, that spew these things. I mean, come on, they they do it to their own. They did it to John Kennedy, and you know? so it's not be up above them. Come on, you guys. Some of y'all were barely born, so I just give y'all an excuse. You know, you just don't know nothing. Okay, so let somebody try to teach you something, but you can't just go by some of these clips that you see on YouTube. Some some things you have had to have been there, okay? You know, so just like I can tell y'all Pac and, and, and Biggie were uh, beefing or whatever, but those of y'all who are that age and right there was in it, was jamming off of buying their CDs and right there with them, y'all can school me because you were in it. You were more involved, right? It's the same thing. Um, but Farrakhan got emotional, and then he said, one day, soon, when we have a nation, oh, I think that was to Milton Coleman, because see, when Farrakhan get in his zone, just like performing, he say, you know, he it, 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 the energy takes over, but it's the truth. He said, one day soon, when we have a nation, Milton Coleman um, you got to put the whole thing in a political in the content of a political campaign. Milton Coleman was running for, uh, I mean, uh, Jesse Jackson was running for president, right? And he was doing very well. And while he was running, you know how you have a reporter on the trail with you. He made the mistake because he saw a black guy in there with him, and he got too comfortable. Because, see, white press probably wouldn't have did that if somebody would have said something like, well, we're going to talk to the niggers. They would have kept that a secret. However, Milton Coleman ran back and told his people at the Washington Post that uh, Jesse Jackson had said, um, you know, we got to go to Jaime Town. Okay? So that was very disturbing, and that's when he lost his uh, traction in the campaign because he had Jewish people. He had people who was the Rainbow Coalition. So he had everybody voting for him. <laughs> you know, whether we're, we weren't as knowledgeable as we are today about what politics is, I'm just telling you what happened. Today, we're a lot more knowledgeable about politics than we were then, but Put this in context, because if you're not putting it in context, nothing makes sense. It's like put, trying to fit a circle into a, a square peg. I mean, a square peg into a circle. Y'all get it. Anyway, Milton Coleman ran and told the Washington Post what for, uh, Jesse Jackson said. And soon as Jesse starts slipping in the post, right? 
So Farrakhan said, he was teaching one Sunday, and he was mad. He said, one day, soon, when we have a nation of our own, we're going to deal with our traitors the way America deals with hers. He said, and it'll be a punishment that Milton Coleman, you would, it'd be a punishment uh, fit for dogs or something to that effect. Or, but the whole content was that. Now, not trying to speak for Farrakhan because he does a very good job for himself. I'm just telling you what I got out of it being there. Right? Those of y'all that wasn't there or wasn't sitting in my Miriam, shut your damn mouth. You don't even know the energy that was there. Same thing with what he said, which he, which was uh, what he said that about Malcolm. Now this, I did take offense to that. Okay, I took a very good offense to it. I didn't like it because it it, it, it reminds me of what my father used to call himself scolding me, but then he cut me down to my core with something personal. I. I, I don't like it. Okay, and that's what it reminded me of. However, his words were this, pretty much in the same vein. Amer America is a hypocrite. And and I got all now y'all keep talking about I killed uh far I killed Malcolm, I killed Malcolm. And then he goes, Okay, if we felt Malcolm was a traitor, right? Remember, and let's just put it in context. If we felt Malcolm was a traitor, then we would deal with a traitor just like, uh, you know, America does. So whose traitor was he? Was he ours or did America uh, have the chance and did they reject him? Okay, all those type of hurtful things. Okay. Now, Farrakhan's a man. He ain't God. That's why I was telling you about the prayer and letting him know being in an environment where I can say some of your words hurt me. I was little and I couldn't remember some of the stuff that was going on. It wasn't coming from you. I didn't remember. But some of the things as an adult, you hurt me. And I do know that. But I also know how the nation of Islam gets down. I know how to get down. Okay. So, in any paramilitary group, you can expect it. You think Jam Master J say everything right? No, that's, the, that's the thing of leadership. You think the person sergeant, when they're in this United States Army or Marines, says everything nice and codly? Well, he doesn't. Do you think he might have a more way or answer in a real, maybe disrespectful way to some, but in an okay way to others when he talk about death or, or somebody being killed? Yeah. Some of y'all got to get real and, you, and you're not w w willing to do that. And that's what get me. Um, and it bothers me. Um, Thomas Hagen all, always said, he remember he was captured, and he always said that um, that the other two guys involved was not even there. Well, they weren't involved in it. In the late 1970s, Hagen provided some tantalizing clues in two affidavits filed in 1977 and 1978. He provided partial names of his four accomplices. Okay. He don't tell you who he was with. Hagen identified the shotgun toting man who was the first to open fire on Malcolm as Willie X. See, so that's before uh, he got his name from Elijah Muhammad, obviously. Because when I said Farrakhan and the name change, Elijah Muhammad. Uh, is responsible for um, and the head of the mosque that you ever belong to for giving you your name. 
presenting it to Elijah Muhammad or seeing what it comes back. That's where it used to be. In, if I could remember back in the day, you know, I was born Khadija, so that wasn't my issue. Hagen identified the uh, again the man as Willie X. Hagen's lawyer, the famed William Kunstler, determined that Willie X was the man named William Bradley. Nobody wanted to hear it. But the case quickly went cold. More than three decades passed before Bradley was identified as the towering newer man living under the name of Al Mufasa Shabazz. Yeah. Kunstler dead now. All those good civil rights attorneys that, that, that would look at that. And you don't have any more on the scene now. All you got is money bag men. Back then, you had people that wanted to know the truth. Now all the attorneys just go after the bag. It's what it is. In his 2011 book, Marable wrote that he was able to confirm through sources in Exodus County Black Muslim community that the man formerly known as William Bradley was hiding in plain sight in Newark, New Jersey. Bradley was 15 feet away from Malcolm when he elevated his sawed-off shotgun from under his coat, took careful aim, and fired, Marable wrote. This was the kill shot, the blow that executed Malcolm X. Shabazz's criminal exploits are the stuff of legend in his hometown, Newark, and beyond. Not, uh, I mean, and it's, isn't that ironic that he would wear the name Shabazz? A baseball star at Southside High School, Shabazz was one of three masked gunmen who robbed a bank in nearby Livingston in April of 1968, the court show. The special treatment Shabazz received, Mar Marable wrote, raises the question of whether he was an FBI informant, either after the assassination of Malcolm X, or even possibly before. Y'all want to talk about that, right? Y'all want to keep it on. You listen to all these uh, other content creators and you know, little boys and you know people that don't really know anything. And y'all got the nerve. Never mind. Whatever connections Shabazz may have had, they failed to keep him out of prison. Okay, because that was for something totally different. But he was jailed, as Corey would say, but he was jailed from 77 to 80 on conspiracy charges, officials said. Shabazz returned to prison in 1984 after being indicted on charges that include threatening to kill an East Orange cop, raping a woman, and drug dealing. See, and you said he was a Muslim? <laughs> he thought he had it going on. This is a guy that feels he's got, and, and if he did that, and he only went to jail from 77 to 80, three years? Oh, my God. Mm, mm, mm. Mm, 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 mm. Oh my God. Um, he emerged from prison. I mean, in the court, in the court records, the name William Bradley is listed as Shabazz's alias. Okay. He emerged from prison in 1998. By then, Shabazz was known as Newark's black Muslim community as an enforcer and not to be messed with. He was like a street legend. If you mention his name, it would invoke fear for blocks, said a longtime member who asked to remain anonymous. He was notorious. Shabazz turned his life around through his marriage to Carolyn Kelly, a powerful New Newark activist who was instrumental in the fight to overturn the murder conviction of boxer Reuben Hurricane Carter. 